Hi everyone, welcome to episode 6. So our task today is getting enemy attacks working. So the uh, basic idea is that when our enemy comes within a certain distance of the player, the enemy is going to turn red and it's going to perform a lunge. So let us go into the enemy script and I'm going to create a new float, call it something like the attack distance threshold. And I'll maybe set this equal to 1.5. And then in our update method, we want to see if the distance from the enemy to the target is less than the distance threshold. So, uh, one way we could get the distance is using the vector3.distance method, of course, and just pass in the two positions. But uh, one thing to always be aware of uh, with distances is that it's having to use the square root operation, uh, which is sort of fairly expensive. So, when we don't need to know the actual distance, but we're just comparing two distances, we can, uh, we can take those distances in their squared form and avoid the square root operation. So let's say float uh, square distance uh, to target, perhaps, is equal to, and we can get our target's position and subtract our own position from it, and then we can get the square magnitude of that vector, in other words, the distance squared, uh, to the target, and then we can say if the square distance to target is less than, and then we want to square our attack distance threshold, so we can say mathf dot power of uh, attack distance threshold to the power 2. Okay, so if that's the case, then uh, we, we probably don't want to attack every frame that that's the case. We should have some sort of timer uh, between the attacks. So we can say float time between attacks and maybe set that equal to like one second. And then we can have a float for our next available attack time. So we can say if, uh, if we're close enough, um, but we only need to check if we're close enough if, uh, if we can at if, if we're sort of within our next attack time. So we can say if time.time .time is uh, greater than next attack time, then we'll check our distances. Okay, so if then the distance is close enough to attack, we can set our next attack time equal to the current time plus the time between attacks. All right, and uh, we're going to want to start our attack coroutine. So uh, let me just copy this over here. I enumerator attack. And inside here we'll call uh, start coroutine attack. OK, so now inside of the attack coroutine, we want to animate our lunge. So we're going to need to store our starting position and a sort of target position, and then uh, we're going to go from our starting position to our target position, and then back to our starting position to sort of make it look as if we're leaping at the player. So let's, uh, let's store a vector 3 for original position, and this is just equal to our current position. And vector 3, you can call this the attack position. And for now, we'll just set that equal to our target's position. So we'll literally leap right on top of our player. Um, then uh, let's, uh, we, we want a, a float to determine how far into the sort of uh, lunge animation we are. So we can call this our, um, we can just call this percent. So this is going to be a value from 0 to 1. And uh, then we can just have a while loop. We can say while the percent is less than or equal to 1, then we'll animate our lunge. And uh, since this is a coroutine, of course, we want to say yield return null to just uh, skip a frame between each uh, step in the while loop. So what we essentially want um, is for the percentage to be cre increasing by time dot delta time multiplied by some variable attack speed, uh, which we can set over here. Float attack speed, or maybe set that equal to three. So uh, obviously the, the higher that is, the faster our attack animation is going to be. So now we've got this, this percentage going from zero to one, 
But um, since we want to start at the original position, go to the attack position, and then go back to the original position, what we really need is a value that goes from 0 to 1, and then back to 0 again. So uh, we could use a, uh, an equation for a parabola to do this, something like y equals negative x squared plus x all multiplied by 4. So we can call this our maybe our interpolation value. So this will be equal to um, percent is our x, so we want to say negative percent squared. So negative, we can maybe just say percent times percent, um, plus percentage, all multiplied by 4. Okay, I think instead of doing percent multiplied by percentage, maybe a little bit clearer if I do um, math f dot power of percent to the power 2. Okay, so that's our interpolation value. Um, we can now say that our transform's position is equal to, and we're going to use vector 3 dot lerp to go from the original position to the, uh, to the attack position, and we'll pass in interpolation as our value. So when interpolation is 0, we'll be at the original position. When it's 1, we'll be at the attack position. And when it goes back to 0 again, we'll be back at our original position. So that's great. Um, now, of course, while we're attacking, uh, we don't want the, the pathfinding to continue moving towards the player, because that's going to interfere with this little, this little uh, animation we've set up here. So uh, we can start off over here by saying pathfinder.enabled equals false and once we've finished attacking we can re-enable our pathfinder by saying enabled equals true but um, one thing we might be worried about is that the pathfinder will call set destination at some point during the attack and it's going to find that pathfinder is disabled and it's going to return an error so what we'd really like to do is store the current state of the enemy so that if it's attacking, then it doesn't bother trying to set the path. So a nice way to do this is with enums. We can make a public enum called state uh, with a capital S, open, uh, open curly brackets, and we'll list our states here. So either our enemy could be doing nothing, in which case it's idle, or it could be chasing the player, or it could be in the process of attacking the player. Those are the three, the three distinct states that it could be in. And then we can make a state variable called our current state. And in the start method, let's say that um, the default state is current state equals state, not string, state dot chasing. So by default, it's chasing. And uh, we're only going to update the path if the current state is, in fact, equal to chasing. OK, otherwise we don't bother. Now, when we attack, we can say, during the attack, the current state is equal to state.attacking. So the update path won't run. And when we're finished, the current state will go back to state.chasing. OK, let's see how this, uh, how this is looking. I'm going to just move my player out of the spawn position uh, so that we can see more clearly. And I'm going to go into my spawner and just change the enemy count down to 1 so we can just focus on one enemy at a time. Let's press play. It comes towards us and it performs a nice little lunge. Uh, the, the first one looks really good, but now it's sort of, well, it's, it's gone inside of us, so it's a little bit difficult to see what's going on. Um, so, so what we'd want, if I just quickly uh, comment out this start attack coroutine over here, um, we, don't, we don't want the enemy to really be pathfinding to our exact position. We rather want it to pathfind to a position just outside of our collision radius. So uh, in order to find such a position, we're going to need to know the collision radius of the player as well as the collision radius of the enemy. So let's create two floats over here. Float, uh, we can call it my collision radius, uh, referring, of course, to the enemy itself, and then float for the target collision radius. OK, 
Okay, and we can set those in the start method. We can say my collision radius is equal to, and we'll get our own uh, capsule collider component, get the radius value from that, and target collision radius is of course equal to the same thing on the target, so target.get component uh, capsule collider dot radius. And then when we're updating the path, instead of setting our target position equal to the actual target's position, um, we want to set it equal to target position minus the direction uh, sort of between the enemy and the target multiplied by uh, the, the radius of the two uh, collision bounds. So first thing to do is to get the direction to the target. Okay, and that's simple enough. We can always do that by saying target.position minus our own position and normalize that vector. Okay, um, so now we've got the direction to the target. We can say that the target position is equal to, all right, the target's position minus the direction to the target and we want to multiply that by my collision radius plus the target's collision radius. Okay, let's see how that's looking. So remember, attacks are still disabled. I commented that code out, but you can see it's stopping just before it gets to us. Um, so that's, that's much nicer. Um, okay. Um, for, for our lunge to, to work, of course, well, not to work, but to sort of look uh, nice, it, it, it needs to start a little bit away from the player, so it's got some, some space to do the lunge in. So I'm actually going to make it stop, not just outside the bounds, but I'm also going to add the attack distance threshold divided by two to that. Okay, so now if we play the game, the enemy should be stopping a little distance away from the player, but... Um, what I'd like to do is, at, at the moment, we're, we're taking the attack threshold distance as being measured from the center of the enemy to the center of the player. Um, I'd rather measure it as the distance between the edge of the player and the edge of the enemy, um, in which case we'll, uh, we'll, make it, we'll make the value a lot smaller, say 0.5. And uh, when we're comparing the distances over here, um, we've got the square distance to target, which is obviously from the center of the target to the center of the uh, of the enemy. Um, so we're going to have to say, all right, the attack threshold distance is from the edge of the two colliders. So in order to get it from the center of the two colliders, we're going to have to add the radius of both the colliders onto it. So we'll add my collision radius plus the target collision radius. And uh, let me re-enable the attacks, and let's see if this is all working nicely. Okay, so that looks quite nice. Um, I think it would be better if the enemy didn't lunge all the way inside of the player, though. That looks weird. Um, it can maybe just sort of lunge a tiny bit inside, so it sort of looks like it's taking a bite out of the player. Um, so let's go back to the enemy script, and uh, if we go down to the update path uh, coroutine, we can maybe just steal these two lines over here. We're going to use that inside of our attack coroutine for figuring out the attack position. So um, we can, uh, let's rename target position to attack position and just delete this, this variable over here. Um, so we can say that our attack position is equal to our target position and then we're subtracting direction to target multiplied by all of this. Um, if we remove this bit over here about the attack distance threshold, now the attack should be uh, no longer intersecting with the with the player at all. Uh, let's see if that's the case. So it just sort of um, lunges to the edge of the collider, which is which is nice, but it doesn't have the same sort of sense of impact as it did before when it was actually going inside of the inside of the player. So let's maybe uh, let's maybe remove the target collision radius. So uh, so it should go sort of, yeah, like just a little bit inside. That looks quite nice. Okay, um, the last thing we want to do is to just get the enemy to turn red as it's attacking. So we're going to need to get the material of the enemy. Um, we can store that over here, perhaps. Material, um, we can call this the skin material. And uh, over here we can say 
um, skin oops skin material is equal to get component renderer dot material all right and we'll of course want to return to our original color after we finished attacking so let's store um, store over here color original color and we can set that original color equals skin material dot color and when we attack at the top we can say um, skin material dot color is equal to color dot red and at the end we just return skin material dot color now equals uh, now equals our oops our original color okay let's have a look at that Okay, that looks pretty cool. Um, I'm just gonna, well, I'm gonna kill this enemy. Okay, so now we get a whole bunch of them, all attacking us. Very aggressive. Yeah, so I think that's looking pretty good. Um, in the next episode, we're probably gonna want to make some minor improvements to our enemy class. But uh, after that, we'll start on the exciting topic of generating random levels. So uh, yeah, until then, thanks for watching. Cheers.